thanks for listening to Season 2 of the Matt Lubu Podcast. For this season, I'll be posting supplementary materials on my website, mattlupu.com. There, you can find maps, photos, and more to go along with each episode. Check out the entry for this episode. It's up right now. Once again, you can find it all at mattlupu.com. And now, on to the show. Last time, we talked about the first Rus raid against the Eastern Roman Empire, and how Christianity, coincidentally, right around that time began to make serious inroads into the greater Slavic world. Today, I want to take a tour of the Rus lands as recorded in the Primary Chronicle in the years immediately after the Rus raid of 860. That tour, I think, will prove interesting. Before we get started, a note of caution. I mentioned at the beginning of this series that the Rus Primary Chronicle is not the most reliable of documents, but when it comes to the very earliest years of Rus history, it is the only historical document to relate the earliest ruling dynasties of the Rus. When I say historical source, I mean an analytic account that gives us a year-after-year breakdown of events. Because the Primary Chronicle is the only document to tell the Rus history from the Rus perspective at this time, historians are constantly trying to fill in the picture with archaeological evidence and evidence from other historical sources, either Rus sources written later or contemporary sources written by other people. We've encountered this problem numerous times already in this series, but when it comes to the first few rulers of the Rus, the problem is acute and the evidence particularly thin. To recap what the Primary Chronicle tells us, Rurik, a Varangian from Scandinavia, travels to Novgorod, where the people at the time of the writing are Varangians, although previously they were Slavs. Many scholars take this tidbit of information to mean that the population of Novgorod was perhaps more Varangian than Slav in the earliest days of the settlement. At some point, Rurik gives permission to his boyars, or warlords, to go to Tsargrad, or Constantinople. On that trip, two of Rurik's boyars, Deir and Oskold, see the settlement of Kiev and decide that they want to stay. They establish dominion over the city with a small group of other Varangians at the same time that Rurik holds power over Novgorod. The primary chronicle dates this event to sometime between 863 and 866 AD, but then goes on to say that it was Askold and Deer who organized the attack on Constantinople. Again, if you'll recall, that attack can be dated in the Roman sources to 860 AD, giving us a three to six year discrepancy between the Rus and Roman histories. Unsurprisingly, scholars have been arguing over that discrepancy for decades. The arguments are fascinating, but I think a little bit too in-depth for the purposes of this podcast, unless you all are into that sort of thing. Anyways, I should mention here that there is another copy of the Primary Chronicle, called the Hypatia Codex, that was rediscovered in the 18th century. It differs from the better-known Laurentian Codex in an important way, in that it gives a slightly different story of the first colonization of the Varangians over Slav lands. The Codex preserves the following story. They took with them all the Rus, and came first to the Slavs, and they built the city of Ladoga. Rurik, the eldest, settled in Ladoga, Cineus, the second, at Belusero, and Truvor, the third, at Izborsk. From these Varangians, the land of Rus received its name. After two years, Cineus died, as well as his brother, Truvor, and Rurik assumed the sole authority. He then came to Lake Ilmen and founded on the Volkov River a city 
which they named Novgorod, and he settled there as prince. That account seems to square better with the archaeological record. The town of Latiga is quite close to the Baltic Sea, and would have been easy to access from the east coast of Sweden. Additionally, numerous Viking burial mounds have been discovered and excavated at the site. To this day, the Russian people know it as the first Rus city. There's a living history museum there and everything. While the primary chronicle dates the foundation of the city of Kiev to sometime between 860 and 862 AD, archaeological research on the site only dates the first settlements back to about 887 AD. If Askold and Deer were indeed the architects of the Rus raid on Constantinople, then they must have had control of the city before 860 AD. Indeed, according to a later chronicle, Askold and Deer ruled over Kiev by at least 842 AD. But that would put the foundation of Kiev to earlier than Novgorod, and would probably have made Askold and Deer too old to have ordered the attack on Constantinople. Whatever the truth of the matter, Askold and Deer would not establish a lasting dynasty in the city. Upon the death of Rurik, his realm and control over Novgorod was bequeathed to a relative of his named Oleg. In addition, he left Oleg in charge of his infant son, Igor. Here's what the primary chronicle has to say about the immediate aftermath of the reign of Rurik. On his deathbed, Rurik bequeathed his realm to Oleg, who belonged to his kin, and entrusted to Oleg's hand his son Igor, for he was very young. Oleg set forth, taking with him many warriors from among the Varangians, the Chuds, and the Slavs. He then came to the hills of Kiev, and saw how Askold and Deer reigned there. He hid his warriors in the boats, left some others behind, and went forward himself, bearing the child Igor. He thus came to the foot of the Hungarian hill, and after concealing his troops, he sent messengers to Askold and Deer, representing himself as a stranger on his way to Greece on an errand for Oleg and for Igor, the prince's son, and requesting that they should come forth to greet them as members of their race. Askold and Deer straightway came forth. Then all the soldiery jumped out of the boats, and Oleg said to Askold and Deer, you are not princes, nor even of princely stock, but I am of princely birth. Igor was then brought forward, and Oleg announced that he was the son of Rurik. They killed Askold and Deer, and after carrying them to the hill, they buried them there, on the hill now known as Hungarian, where the castle of Olma now stands. Oleg set himself up as prince in Kiev, and declared that it should be the mother of Russian cities. The Varangians, Slavs, and others who accompanied him were called Rus. Oleg began to build stockaded towns and impose tribute on the Slavs, the Kravichians, and the Marians. He commanded that Novgorod should pay the Varangians tribute to the amount of 300 grivni a year for the preservation of peace. A quick note here about grivni. That indicates a standard weight of silver that the Slavic people commonly used. Originally, that word meant a necklace or torque, but at some point changed into both a unit of weight and a unit of value. Units of weight corresponding to units of value were quite common in antiquity, and still exist today in the English-speaking world with the British pound. Oleg would spend the early part of his reign consolidating the independent Slavs around Kiev into his realm. Of particular concern was removing Khazar influence from Slav land. The story given in the primary chronicle is that Oleg freed Kiev from Khazar tribute in 882 AD, but that has come into question in recent years. The controversy this time stems from a letter discovered in 1898. The letter in question is called the Schechter Letter, which was found in a stack of documents known as the Cairo Geniza Collection. You see, in Judaism, there is a belief that when a holy document, that is to say, any document that contains the name of God, becomes too old and worn to use regularly, or is otherwise irrelevant and needs to be destroyed, it must be ceremonially buried. 
Typically, there's an intermediary step between the decision to be rid of a document and its burial. That is, its temporary storage in a geniza. These locations can be found in attics or basements of synagogues, or even in cemeteries where the documents will eventually be interred. Traditionally, the contents of a geniza would be buried every seven years or during times of drought in the hopes that the act would bring rain. But apparently something went wrong at the Ben Ezra synagogue in Cairo at some point in the 6th or 7th century. It's difficult to say for sure why they stopped burying the documents kept in the Cairo Geniza. According to Simon von Geldern, who visited the Geniza in 1753, nobody would touch the documents because of a local tradition that claimed horrible disaster would befall anyone who did so. Perhaps as a result of this local legend, the collection grew to something like 400,000 documents. Most of these have now landed in various Western libraries, many of them in Cambridge. So that's where the Schechter letter comes from. Now as for what it says, much of the letter is illegible, but two tracts of text survive. The first tract describes the conversion of the Khazars, although the story preserved is unique to the letter and not corroborated by any other known sources. It claims that the Khazars converted to Judaism as the result of a mass migration of Jews from Armenia and Persia fleeing persecution to Khazar land. According to this account, a strong Khazar leader named Sabrael arose, who was distantly related to these Jews. His wife, Serak, convinces him to convert to Judaism, and he does so. The next legible tract describes a recent invasion of Khazar land by a prince of the Rus named Helgu at the behest of the Eastern Roman Emperor Romanos Lecapinos. Now we have another conundrum. If we are to believe the Schechter letter, then Helgu probably refers to Oleg, but it would put his reign much later than what is recorded in the primary chronicle. The usual dating for Oleg's reign is between 879 and 912 AD, but we know about the Rus' war against the Khazars and the reign of Romanos Lecapinos, which both occurred in the 940s AD. So what's going on here? Oleg certainly didn't reign and fight wars for 70 years. One way to resolve the problem is to ignore the Schechter letter on the strength of the first legible part of it, Many scholars are convinced that the letter is part of a later Jewish literary genre concerning the lost tribes of Israel, and that the story regarding the conversion of the Khazars should be read as mythology. Those scholars think that largely because of the names of the Khazar leaders given, which happen to be names of angels in the Old Testament. If that first part of the letter is a myth, then why not the second part? But other scholars are not so quick to dismiss the Schechter letter, especially because it contains a brief story of Helgu's death, which seems to match up with Arabic sources. The story goes that Helgu fled to Fers, presumably Persia, and was killed there. This might refer to the Rus' attack on the Muslim land of Iran, in what is now Azerbaijan in 944 AD. Now, if we decide that the second part of the Schechter letter is historical, then there are several implications. Firstly, the defeat of the Khazars at the hands of the Rus must have occurred later than the primary chronicle tells us. Next, Oleg and his successor Igor must have ruled not immediately after Rurik, but perhaps a century later, leaving a lost generation of Rus leaders in between. Some scholars prefer this state of affairs. Then there are those who have attempted to harmonize the Schechter letter into the primary chronicle's timeline. They contend that the name Helgu might be a title, like that of Chakanus or Khan. Indeed, there is a word in Old Norse, Helgu, meaning holy. If this is the case, then the Oleg of the primary chronicle need not be the same Helgu of the Schechter letter. Perhaps this Helgu was another boyar, or minor Rus leader, 
since we do have the text of a peace treaty between the Rus and the Romans that mentions fair and great princes of the Rus. Whatever the case may be, the primary chronicle relates the conversion of the Bulgars in detail just after the section describing the rise of Oleg, suggesting that under his reign, some time after the first Rus raid on Constantinople, the process of Rus Christianization had already begun. The next major event in the Chronicle occurs in 904 AD. This is a long account of another Rus raid on Constantinople. Because I think it's cool, I'll go ahead and read it for you. Leaving Igor in Kiev, Oleg attacked the Greeks. He took with him a multitude of Varangians, Slavs, Chuds, Krivichians, Marians, Polianians, Severians, Drevelians, Radamichians, Croats, Dulebians, and Teverkians, who were pagans. All these tribes are known as Great Scythia by the Greeks. With this entire force, Oleg sallied forth by horse and by ship, and the number of his vessels was 2,000. He arrived before Tsargrad, but the Greeks fortified the strait and closed up the city. Oleg disembarked upon the shore and ordered his soldiery to beach the ships. They waged war around the city and accomplished much slaughter of the Greeks. They also destroyed many places and burned the churches. Of the prisoners they captured, some they beheaded, some they tortured, some they shot, and still others they cast into the sea. The Rus inflicted many other woes upon the Greeks after the usual manner of soldiers. Oleg commanded his warriors to make wheels, which they attached to the ships, and when the wind was favorable, they spread the sails and bore down upon the city from the open country. When the Greeks beheld this, they were afraid, and sending messengers to Oleg, they implored him not to destroy the city, and offered to submit to such tribute as he should desire. Thus, Oleg halted his troops. The Greeks then brought out to him food and wine, but he would not accept it, for it was mixed with poison. Then the Greeks were terrified and exclaimed, This is not Oleg, but Saint Demetrius, whom God has sent upon us. So Oleg demanded that they pay tribute for his 2,000 ships at the rate of 12 grivni per man, with 40 men reckoned to a ship. The Greeks assented to these terms, and prayed for peace, lest Oleg should conquer the land of Greece. Retiring thus a short distance from the city, Oleg concluded a peace with the Greek emperors Leo and Alexander, and sent into the city to them Karl, Farulf, Vermund, Hrolaf, and Steinvinth, with instructions to receive the tribute. The Greeks promised to satisfy their requirements. Oleg demanded that they should give to the troops on the 2,000 ships 12 grivni per bench, and pay in addition the sums required for the various Russian cities, first Kiev, then Chernigov, then Perislavl, Polotsk, Rostov, Lyubek, and the other towns. In these cities lived great princes subject to Oleg. This account is followed by a copy of a peace treaty that the Romans concluded with the Rus dated to 907, and then another dated to 912. Now, I know what you're thinking. The Rus put wheels on their boats and turned them into cars? Oleg somehow can tell that the food and wine the Romans bring to him is poison? If you're thinking that a few details in that story strain belief, you're not the only one. In fact, several scholars have proposed that this episode in the Primary Chronicle might be a memory of the 860 Rus attack on Constantinople that has been reinserted between that attack and the Roman Rus Peace Treaty of 912. Take, for example, the number of ships. In the story above, it's 2,000, but in the 860 attack, it was 200. Perhaps this is not coincidental. Other scholars have pointed out that Oleg has semi-legendary attributes when it comes to prophecy and exposure to personal danger. It's entirely possible that these attributes were retrojected back into this story from the position of the writers of the Primary Chronicle, which would explain the episode of him refusing the food and the wine. Whatever the truth of the account, 
we have no reason to disbelieve the story of the peace of 912. It seems that the Rus were in near constant contact with the Romans for the purposes of trade and mercenary work between their first collision in 860 and the formal treaty signed in 912. The Romans, legalistic as ever, had a habit of formalizing relations with other groups of people by means of treaty. The fact that we have reference to it both in Rus and Roman sources gives historians a high degree of confidence that relations between the peoples, by the conclusion of the treaty anyways, had been long-standing and generally good. There's also reason to believe that the language of this treaty heavily influenced the law codes that the Rus would later adopt in their own kingdom. This pattern of increased contact and influence from Rome to the Rus would only intensify as time goes on. Next time, we will explore the nature of that influence as the Rus officially and permanently adopt Eastern Christianity as their state religion, and Rus warriors swear their loyalty to defending the person of the emperor, whoever it may be. As always, I'm Matt Lupu. Thanks for listening.